Evening all, uh, you're joining us in, uh, well, somewhere near Birmingham and we found this magnificent beast on the way here. Um, we may not be able to use the meat but we're going to have uh, as good a, a go as possible using all the other bits. Um, and what's more we're going to butcher it with Paleolithic tools. What I'm thinking about is using various hand axes and comparing them and seeing which are most effective. Now, um, one of the things we wondered about, uh, just the other day in fact, was how easy it would be for one or two people to handle um, a big carcass. I mean, obviously this isn't on the scale of mammoths and some of the Ice Age uh, megafauna, but it's still a big beast. We, we did a little um, very unscientific experiment and I reckon it's heavier than Jay, which means it's about 11 stone-ish and it doesn't have the head on and it doesn't have the guts in. So there's quite a lot of, of deer here. Um, this one was a, obviously a road kill. Um, now, what surprised me was how easy it is to move just using leverage, um, much as though you would you do if you were putting a person in the recovery position. So um, what I'm going to do is just move it this way a bit and then just see the broken limb there. Um, perfectly doable. Um, earlier I actually did it with one hand, so um, surprisingly easy. There's just a knack to it. Now we've got this already because otherwise we wouldn't have lifted it into the van. Um, and my, my first cut would, would normally be along here to get the guts out. That's already done. Um, so off we go. <laughs> uh, and that's that's the hand axe we're going to be using. And um, do you want to pan onto those ones over there? This one. That's a butted hand axe. And uh, that one, I believe, is called the Ficron hand axe, which is a very early type. But as you can see, it's got quite nice, sharp edges. Um, and uh, we'll see how that one works. <laughs> I think it's got a wood in a bum. There he is. It's hard to see what I'm doing with this and the greenness of it. I'm curious how this cuts through the skin too, because bearing in mind these have been handled a lot. The other thing is they're not pristine.
So obviously that's his uh, purse. His purse, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the nads. Um, however yeah. you want to explain it, guys. <laughs> I've got a fallow deer one that's been made into a neat little bag that I keep some precious objects in. And uh, I have to say, of all the props we have, it's the one we've had the most amusement with by uh, throwing it at teachers. One thing that people often not do wrong but um, don't realise with skinning is that a lot of it can be done with your hands um, and actually um, you, you don't need to use the tool for, um, for all of it. I see a broken leg there obviously from the, the uh, injury. a lot of fluid collected in these tissues here and um, so that says to me that well firstly it was lying on this side and secondly um, that's an indication of probably bruising as well so trauma in general yeah so I think his back well you can see his back end certainly took some of the hit um, we'll see more when we get into it but it, it, it tells us something about how um, painfully aware people must have been of just what an injury does to the inside of the body because um, you know they were seeing it on a fairly regular basis you know what does a spear injury look like what does a um, an infected injury look like potentially what does a broken bone do after so many days um, what does a badly healed bone do so I, I'd be interested in, in sort of um, I know there are examples of where people have obviously survived fairly bad injuries. Um, and, uh, now, here's a bit where I'm struggling just purely because it's in an awkward angle. And I think if I was doing this with help, here I'd get the other person to, to hold the leg up to just to help me get a better angle. Um, and I, I don't know, I suppose the the chances of a of a Stone Age person having to take apart a deer like this by themselves, I I would think are fairly slim. Um because you know they might have to gut it and chop it to, to bits out or you know gut it and, and and get it back to camp with a few of them. But I would imagine once they were back, um everyone would be pitching in I mean I'd, I'd imagine you'd have three people along this at least all heaving the skin off it um, now what I'm finding in here is the legs are awkward um, and maneuvering a big big tool like that that's the Ficron hand axe um, is a bit awkward so I'm going to switch to just a flake um, the other thing is that obviously these have been part of my handling kit for a while so they've been clinked against each other, they've been handled, so um, they're not necessarily as sharp as they would be, but they're, they're obviously still doing the job. But in here, I just want a little, you know, little little one that's going to enable me to get into the gaps. So let's, uh, let's go with that one. That looks pretty good. 
it's got a nice flat area on the back this area is, is really sharp um, it's nothing special um, but I think that'll do the job nicely oh yeah that's good now I'm going down the backs of the legs because I believe um, well, partly that's just how I'm used to doing it but also the um, skin ends up a more rectangular shape if you do that if you skin up the front of the legs, you can end up with a skin that's got lots of, you know, sticky out bits. And, uh, you know, they're just sort of not as much use. Whereas doing it like this gives you... A... Oh, you see how this is going through the skin like, like a hot knife through butter. I have nipped the tendon there, but it's not a particularly useful tendon, that one. Now, the other thing I'm finding is that... Um, the skin is just really not coming off that easily, particularly where we've got a lot of injury. I mean, look at the, the hemorrhaging in here. Um, that's obviously where the, the leg's been broken. The, the break's just there. Um, so, unfortunately, that is an injury, I think, that happened while it was alive. Um, there's, there's clotting and sort of... Yeah... I watch a lot of CSI, so I might be talking rubbish, but <laughs> I think that's the case. And actually that broken leg is helping me now. Yeah, the skin's not giving me much slack at all. And um, sometimes you can kind of pull away um, areas, but uh, it's not really doing it. I'm going to cut the skin off round here as well, and um, we'll, um, we'll deal with the lower leg as a separate entity. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to be quite careful with broken ends of bones as well, they can be extremely sharp and also extremely manky so you can you can get nasty cuts off them which uh, are going to go bad and give you a problem um, I've had to go on antibiotics twice um, more as a result of doing hide working with slightly manky hides I should have known better but um, it's uh, it's not uncommon so uh, we're going to be making use of modern soap and hot water here. Now, uh, normally I'd try and cut this at the joint, but obviously that's um, a bit of a lost cause there, because it's all completely mangled. So I'm just going to... injury even if the meat was uh, generally edible I wouldn't be eating this bit there's too much blood in it and it's it's just that that fluid stuff seems to go off really quickly and it, it taints the meat it's nasty and I don't imagine it's very good for you as well it's a shame this bone's broken because these are really useful and actually we're doing a bone flute making workshop with someone I met at the bushcraft show which we'll um, of course be videoing um, and he says this bone here is um, or maybe it's this bone I'm not sure one of the, the upper leg bones is very good for making flutes um, but we've got the other one to play with so I 
hands too close in there because, um, as I said, the, the sharpens the bone are pretty, pretty nasty and you can't see what you're doing. So there's, there's that. So it's going to pause out. Done one back leg. What I'm going to try and do is do one whole side of it, and then um, I can roll it onto the skin, as it were, so that even even though we're not keeping the meat, if we were keeping the meat, the meat is at no point going on the deck. You see what I mean? Um, what I'm really finding is that, um, especially around the back end, where all that horrendous damage is. Um, the skin is just not coming off. <laughs> um, whereas here, I'm fairly, fairly weight, well able to just sort of push it away. This area here on the back of the shoulder blades can always be a bit tricky. I think we've got more damage here to a few broken bones, so you have to be a bit careful. You can see the contrast between um, the side it was lying on and the side that was facing up as well so if I was a picky scavenger um, I'd eat the side that was facing up <laughs> though I suspect none of this is going in the pot not the way it smells I suspect it only died uh, either last night or the night before I don't think it's that old and the weather's been fairly cool here um, unfortunately, because someone has had the, um, the head, we can't look at the eyes and use them as a hint. That's normally something I'd look at. There was so much trauma with the, uh, with the stomach and the innards as well. We couldn't really gauge that, could we? No, I mean, there was some bloating, but it wasn't too bad. Um, but again, it's been getting down, I think, to sort of five degrees or even cooler at night. So there was definitely no, no warmth in the carcass at all, um, and I think the mortis had set in, so it's hard to know really. Mind you, I suppose, because they go into rigor mortis and then they come out of rigor mortis, so maybe that tends to be more in favour of um, last night as opposed to further ago. It's really not that stinky. As as carcasses go. Um, I'm surprised because I've the only animal uh, this sort of size I've taken a buck before was a fallow buck, which was not far off the same size actually, surprisingly. Um, and we did that with two of us with modern knives, and I swear we found it harder than this. <laughs> so maybe that's practice or maybe I don't know. We've got better lighting this time and it's not as cold and chilled. So there's a lot of attachment points here. Uh, so it's actually easier to do it with the skin, with the, uh, with the flake rather than the um, well with it with a knife rather than cutting it off. Let's try the um the ovate hand axe now. I really, my favourite so far is this um, Mousterian, Mousterian hand axe, so that's a Neanderthal type one. Um, but we're going to try this one. I suspect I'll be annoyed that there isn't a point on the end, but we shall see. This one's never been used for anything experimental before, so potentially it's a keener edge. But I also made it and the other one was made by a better flint than me, so we'll see. Let's so one's doing the job quite nicely. The, the serrations on the edge, um, unintentional though they may be, are actually quite useful. Now again, we're going 
ਇੱਕ ਨੇ That's a good way to do it because then you can pull and push and you can use your weight and um, sort of lock your arms straight as well, which is quite a strong position. There's a lot of attachment points around these joints. Lovely tendons there. What I tend to do here is flex the knee. And then it's a bit awkward. Sometimes you can sort of flex the knee, hold one end against a fixed fixed point like your own lap or something, and push against it. Right, let's have this here, and then we'll be nearly done with this side, but we've got the most difficult bit yet, I fear, which will be the neck. Now, um, because this poor boy was um, in the rut, in fact, maybe that's why he got run over, he was too busy eyeing up the ladies, um, the neck will be extremely tough. Um, I don't know if it's to do with the adrenaline of fighting other males or what, but they seem to get extra butch um, at this time of year. And apparently the, dis the difference is noticeable in the uh, skin as well. It takes a lot more work to make it soft. I haven't decided yet. Um, whether we'll be um, using the skin fur on or fur off, it probably depends by how on how um, sheddy it's going to be. Often, when a when an animal's been hit and there's a lot of bruising, um, it can make the hair fall out more easily. So, I suspect. Um, unfortunate though it is that he's going to end up being buckskin. Now there's a lot of flesh here that's wanting to stick on the skin. Um, I personally I always struggle with that around the neck, and I'd rather that leave a bit of meat on the on the skin than um, damage the skin because this skin up around the neck get out of there, you. Um, is very handy for things like shoe soles and. You know, really tough jobs so here. I don't want to. Uh, it's a real big attachment point here. I don't want to damage it. Uh, often, when you get skins from someone who's who's mainly just trying to skin it as quickly as possible because they're after the meat, then the the skin of the neck is covered in uh, quite deep score marks, which um, it's not the end of the world, but they're a bit of a pain. Right. I don't suppose you could just hold that leg back, could you, Jay? Would you? Look, sit. No. <laughs> Got it? So I need to be able to pull it against you. Go. Obviously, the cleaner the um, skin can come off, the better. So I've left a bit of scoring there, but I think it's fairly superficial. Um, yeah, the, the cleaner it can come off, the better. Oh, I've got foot cramp. Um, the centre there. Oh, that's some trauma. He, he got hit well. I'd, I'd be interested to know what hit him and what state it was in afterwards. Well, I think it's probably an Arctic. Yeah. But look at that. There were no bits of vehicle around it. So no, so it's got to be may, something. I mean, he could have got catapulted kind of over the top or something as well. Um, 
which in a way I'm surprised that the antlers were intact enough for someone to nick the head. But who knows? I don't know enough about these things to make a guess at his age without the head. I don't even know if it's possible to tell. But he's certainly a big beast in his prime, I'd say. bit pongy. See when I'm cutting and um, I'm not cutting on the meat and I'm not cutting on the skin what I'm aiming for is this kind of stretched bubblegum layer between the two and that's the uh, connective tissue that joins the, uh, the skin to the muscle. It's the one where if you're born without it you can uh, stretch your skin right up over your head. <laughs> There's a couple of people in the Guinness Book of Records with it. I don't know what the condition's called, but... Should we keep this symmetrical because it's just... It's nice. I like symmetry. But also it does make framing it up straight a lot easier. It's had a lot of damage on there the neck here as well. I mean it's hard to tell what's damaged and what's just fluid lying on the, the downward side but fur on there. It's really nice. But unfortunately, unless we can get this scraped off really quick, or in the freezer, or in salt or something, I think there's a good chance he's going to go bald. There's some a bit of molting around his bum already. Right, this is going to be a bit annoying. easier to cut the skin when it's under tension and then um, that's actually where another person comes in handy I find is you can get them to sort of maneuver the um, carcass around to make it easier for instance this bit here uh, I need to be able to see what I'm doing full stone age kit for doing this and then I decided I really didn't want to have to A wear it all day tomorrow and B clean it. <laughs> so then modern kit a bit. Now there's a bit of leakage of general nastiness around the bottom. If I was doing this for meat I'd be trying to contain that I suppose. But I'm not that bad. And to be fair, perhaps our ancestors, at least the older ancestors, weren't that bothered either. I mean, if we learn from hyenas, with jackals and wolves, they often start from the, uh, the underside and the rear end, so perhaps that's how we started as well. Now I need to clear this area, loosen it so that I can uh, 
then watch yourself. So I can come up this way. Now I'm going to go back to using the um, the little flake as I found. It's sharper because I only struck it today, uh, so it is razor sharp, but it's just a little bit more wieldy for these really fiddly jobs. Well, it's not really fiddly, but skinning the head's really fiddly, but just finicky bits around the legs and stuff. should have done probably is clear the skin up either side of the car which is not too bad sometimes it can be hard to free up an edge that unless um, you sort of have a way into it because I'm guessing from underneath it it's not too bad just watch yourself there in case you get kicked there okay it's quite effective not bothered doing that before saying that it's a heavier animal isn't it it is so you're probably there. using your own you're using the weight of the animal to help remove its own skin yeah that's very true actually yeah, that wouldn't work with a with it's a something like manjack, yeah. No, I have done it with a with a bat and I've used um I've got a little club and I've used that especially for separating tendons out on the legs of these. You make a gap and then get the get a button in there and uh, that will that'll do it, but yeah, that's a good point. Oh I can't get Language. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any children who are watching this. <clears throat> you might have to put down um Caution for <laughs> graphic content. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, some of the things that get graphic contented uh, on Facebook these days are really not graphic. I've seen worse stuff on the news. Uh, so it does somewhat amuse me, I have to say. Um, I've got a bit of a wonk here. The leg skins I tend to do separately anyway, partly because the you know the skin from here to the hoof, if you leave that on the hide, it's just a long sticky outy bit that behaves differently to the rest of the skin and it's actually not that useful as part of the rest of the skin. Um, and you'll never get it as soft using the same amount of work. It need basically it needs special treatment. That's what I'm saying. Um, I was talking to Willow Law about it uh, early last year and she was saying she actually, I think she was saying she actually uses her axe um, and almost the dried scraped skin, she actually tenderises it by striking it with the blade of an axe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, quite a tough bit of skin, but they're very good. I believe the Sami use them on the front of boots. Well, I suppose if it's good enough for the deer's legs, then it's good enough for ours. And they, they fit quite nicely as well. In fact, that's a project I really want to do is a pair of um, winter boots with um, deer leg skins going up the front. Maybe these will be the ones, who knows. We'll have a pair each, can't we? That'd be nice. <laughs> I'll have the front ones because I've got little legs. 
Ted's got a muck like pattern actually. Oh, we can, uh, we could on that, waste on that, that yeah. There. Shoes are a perennial problem for us because um, we use them a lot. You know, we're out doing this at least two days a week all year. They get wet, they get put away wet, you know. And we just never have enough time to make them because there's loads of other stuff we've got to do. And actually, although we're involved in ancient skills all the time, we're involved in demonstrating and teaching them to kids. So there isn't a lot of time for us to um, make... I mean, I've thought about using. Um, I've got like the Bronze Age ones because there's only about that much sewing in them. Yeah. Um, I'll be making. I definitely like them, but they're only really. They're okay in winter, but they're not. Only because we're not going outside. They're not fun in really cold weather. No. They're, um, they're cold. And bits of flint get in them. When your ones are kind of on there. Well, they're third owner now, aren't you? Yeah, and they're literally rotting off my feet, so they really do. <laughs> they really do need to be uh, updated. When I was thinking about using the, uh, I've got some uh, monk jack uh, leg skins, and I've I've sort of done one that I might possibly. Yeah, well, yeah, but I was thinking for my uh, for an arm guard. Oh, for a bracer. Oh, yeah. Possibly. Yeah. I did. I didn't know how. I mean, just as a, an experiment, just to see how, how that would work as a brace. I don't yeah. Know. The only ones that we know about archaeologically are the slate ones, but there's a bit of. What from the Ainsbury about. Archer? Yeah. Yeah. There's some slate and other ones. I, I don't know much about them because they tend to be a bit later. Kind of Bronze Age. I'm not. I tend to stay away from the Bronze Age as much as possible. <laughs> I don't know if you can see in the picture, but there's a kind of greenish tint to this. See if I can just lift your head torch away and to this muscle fascia layer, especially here. Um, I mean that's that's uh, that's to do with stuff collecting in the tissue that that you know we it wouldn't doesn't really have look there. Great, is it? No, it's not. That oh, there we go. I've got it. Yeah, it's just sort of just in, short in a, in a carcass that had been bled properly as well. You wouldn't see usually you wouldn't see all of these small blood vessels in the skin like this um, it's to do with when the animal is dying and aware that it's dying or aware that it's in danger that it sets off um, an adrenaline response which makes clotting happen a lot faster so it means when the animal finally does die it's harder to bleed it out properly um, which is one of the reasons proper hunters get really funny about um, eating roadkill because it's tainted and blah 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 um, and in this particular case yeah I'd agree I'm not going to eat this I don't think if I was desperate yeah I would um, if it was a smaller animal and I was at home I'd be tempted to soak some of it in salt water for a bit because that can leach out some of the mank um, but yeah <laughs> I don't think I, even if I filled the bath with salt water, I wouldn't get this fellow in there, so um, I just don't think it's worth it in this case. But yeah, that's that's something that, that tells you this was a, a bit of a trauma, like, wouldn't it? traumatic death, yeah. shall we say. The old flight off, uh, fight or flight yeah. syndrome, isn't it? But, yeah. We just wanted to go and meet some ladies and look what happened. Uh, that's what oh, that's, that's what it's like in uh, uh, Norfolk, Suffolk when you try to go clubbing. <laughs> you know, it's a dangerous sport. Yeah, the, the other <laughs> big deer I dealt with was this time of year. Actually, it was around Halloween, exactly the same time of year. So um, it's obviously a bit of a it seems to be a bit of a pattern that big boy deer commit harry carry um, when uh, when it's when their minds on other things. Um, the other one I dealt with was a fallow buck and uh, he'd, it looked almost as though he'd lowered his head at the oncoming vehicle because the only damage we could find was a neatly broken neck. Um, we initially thought he'd actually been shot in the neck. It was that, it was that neat. Um, but uh, he'd, he only had one antler 
um, the other broken off as it was growing and so the unequal turning force had just snapped his um, top of his neck and blown up two of the vertebrae. So, hop out and pause again.